Um, well, we can get started. Um, so yeah, my name is uh, Timothy Jacobs. I'm a software developer at Stellar WP, uh, where I lead development of the IP security plugin. Um, alongside of that, I'm also a WordPress core committer, so that means that I work and help work with the WordPress core project, uh, in particular on the REST API. Uh, so if you want to chat about any of those things in general, you can find me in the sponsor booth. We should have time for questions. I don't know exactly how long this is going to run. Uh, we'll see, but I hope we'll have time for questions. If we run out of time, you can find me anywhere. Find me at the after party. Find me over there in the sponsor section. Uh, but yeah, so we're gonna. Oops, I skipped like five slides. This is a mess. So this is like the spoiler, 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 spoiler. Oh no. Okay, here we go. So for, forget what you saw. Okay. Uh, so yeah, the title of my talk is "Let's Kill the Password." Uh, Passkey is the future of authentication for the web. So studies have shown that over 80% of all hacking-related breaches are attributed to password compromises. These are passwords that have been lost. Hackers say, hey, why don't we get any passwords that we want and use them to further dive into someone's system? And 80% of hacking-related breaches are attributed to passwords getting into the wrong hands. <laughs> so passwords suck. <laughs> They're like horrible. No one likes using passwords. They're difficult. If you're doing it right, you have long, complex ones. But most people don't. They use weak passwords. They have reused passwords that they have on tons of different sites. And that's a huge, huge problem. Passwords get stolen. So if you're a password and you say, hey, I have this one password that I use all the time on every single service that I use, and one of those services gets hacked, when your password gets hacked, attackers say, OK, let's try this password at Chase and Bank of America and <laughs> Facebook and every other possible site that they could to say, OK, what else can we do with these passwords that we've gotten? And passwords also suck because they're super susceptible to phishing. So phishing takes multiple different forms, but a lot of it is like, how can I get your password from you without you knowing that, hey, I'm putting this into the attacker's hands? And so we have these kind of different tools. I don't know if, how exactly you can see well the screenshot, but this password is now a horse battery staple. You may have seen this XKCD. It's about pick four random words for a password. Coming up with 25 random characters and memorizing is impossible. But I checked my 1Password account the other day, and I have 970 entries in there. I can't memorize four different words for 970 different accounts. So I don't exactly know how good this advice is. So we've come up with this whole kind of methodology of, OK, we know passwords suck. So what can we do instead of passwords? How can we make this experience stronger? And for years now, we've had two factor. And it's the strongest protection that we have available, basically, up, in, up until, you know, um, it's been two-factor. But so if we look at adoption, if we look at adoption, uh, this is according to Microsoft's 2020 Cyber Signals Report from last year. And they looked at all of their Azure directory accounts. And this is like enterprise accounts where things actually matter. Only 22% of active directory installations for Microsoft had strong authentication, what they're calling two-factor passwordless technologies, things like that. 22% in the enterprise. That's <laughs> this is the place where, like, you yeah, know, creds getting stolen matters. It's not just your Twitter account or something like that, where, okay, we really, really care. <laughs> According to a UK study across UK businesses from last year, only 37% of the businesses they surveyed had a policy in place for, hey, do we have accounts that mandate two factor being set up? And I think there's probably, oh my god. <laughs> I think there's probably a lot of different reasons why passwords have, and why two-factor has taken a while to get off the ground, I guess you could say, um, and not really take off in the enterprise. But I think one of them is probably that it's a very confusing user experience. You kind of get this code, you have to type this code. We tried to make it a little bit better with an email, but it's not great. Oh my god. <laughs> and so I think... Probably one of these reasons is that, well, if we look at places where people voluntarily could use two-factor on their own, and there's very few businesses that actually publish what their numbers are. But Twitter is one of the ones that does, and only 2.6% of Twitter accounts have two-factor set up. Mm -hmm. So I think when we as individuals are just going about our day and our daily lives, we think, hey, two-factor is really complicated, it's annoying, I don't want to use it. And so when businesses are evaluating, like, well, can we really effectively roll this out? everyone. If they don't know how to use two-factor, it's complicated. It's not an easy process. I selected a couple of tweets that I found here that are funny. Uh, the average American wastes 66 years of their life on two-factor authentication. 
obviously, you know, a bit over the top, and it certainly feels that way. <laughs> Minus two factor authentication feel like 17 factor authentications. <laughs> You're checking in all these different sources. And this last one, two factor is the one thing that I hate. It was, everything was better and easier when we used only pure passwords. And I don't think that's, <laughs> I don't think it's unreasonable to feel that way, that, hey, this is a process that really sucks. I guess I intellectually understand this, it makes my account more secure. I found this uh, illustrated in a cool uh, blog article, it's a satirical take, but point, counterpoint, two-factor authentication is the only thing between me and hackers trying to ruin my life versus, well, it's annoying to do. You know, the, the, we've tried to like say, oh, well, you have to use two-factor, you should use two-factor. If you're not using two-factor, you're at risk. And these kinds of arguments, while this is a humorous take on it, I think is kind of the general attitude that we've had it as a security industry to say, hey, you just should be using two-factor. If you're not, you're doing it wrong. And yeah, it's annoying, but so what? You suck it with it, deal with it. The other problem here is that even when you have two-factor, you can still be susceptible to phishing. And I've mentioned phishing a couple of different times. And what do I mean by phishing? What I mean is tricking users into giving up their passwords. So you giving your password over to an attacker to someone you don't mean to. <coughs> this takes a lot of different forms. This is a clever one that I saw the other day, which is of a pop-up. And so we all know like pop-ups are bad or whatever, but this is a pop-up where you kind of see the usual technique of, hey, I want to sign in with my Microsoft account. And a pop-up comes up that looks like the Microsoft account page, but that's not the Microsoft account page. It's not a real pop-up. It's a pop-up that is popped up in the browser window you're on. It says, hey, we know this is a window user. We know what browser they're using, so we're gonna copy all of their styles. And it looks really, really good. <laughs> you can like, actually play around with this. And if you don't pay extra close attention, it looks like you're actually interacting with login.microsoft or login.google.com or whatever. It looks like the actual Google page, because they can steal all of that. It can get more scary though. This is uh, my favorite demo. So what we usually say is, well, if we're going to be fished, look, look for key clues and indicators that this site isn't who you think it is. Maybe they spelled something wrong. Or if I have two factor, maybe my site's protected. This is what looks like a real Microsoft account, the real Microsoft login process. Everything, and it actually is. When this user is entering in their information, they're entering it into what is the pixel perfect copy of Microsoft's login system. The only thing that's changed is the domain name. Essentially, the attacker is using this cool, cool tool called Evil Nginx that sits between the attacker control site and Microsoft. And they say, hey, okay, you input your two factor, you put in your email and password. We'll send it over to Microsoft, and Microsoft says, hey, give me your two-factor code. And the attacker says, okay, we want your two-factor code, and they send you back the exact page that Microsoft sent them. But the only difference was that they got to see everything that happened in between. So even if you're super vigilant and looking like, okay, is this actually behaving correctly? I have two-factor set up. I have all the extra tools available. If you're not 100% vigilant, then the attackers can win. And they only have to succeed once. Once you type in your password into an attacker-controlled account, that that's kind of game. They have your password, now you have to change it, figure out are there any other things that they got into, particularly if there's something like your email, where they get into your email account, they can pivot that access to hacking tons and tons of other sites. So we have to be vigilant every single time, but attackers only need to succeed once. So we kind of came up with, and this might be for a lot of y'all that use Slack and like business environments, this might have been one of the first times you've seen it this kind of passwordless login experience. And this lets us skip passwords, it lets us skip two-factor. We have a simpler user experience. We get an email, we have a code, we type in the code, and that's kind of all we need to know. The problem is email is still kind of slow. I don't know how many times I've waited five minutes for a magic link that's telling me, oh, sign into your account instantly, while I'm checking my email and checking my email and checking my email and trying to log in instantly to interact with someone's product, and that's not a great user experience. The other problem is that while these are kind of phishing resistant, they're not perfect. So this is a screenshot. This is one of the slides that I added as I was up on the train. And I was coming <laughs> from New York City over to Buffalo. And when I was logging into LinkedIn for some unknown reason, if you see the approximate location that's all the way down at the bottom, that's trying to tell me, hey, was this really you who logged in? It says, 
then the approximate location of that person was Philadelphia. I knew I wasn't in Philadelphia when I got that email. It was somewhere in upstate New York. But this location safety thing that's trying to say, hey, be super careful, maybe this is an attacker. And sure, if that said, you know, Russia, I may be like, okay, this is a sign that I shouldn't click on this link. But so often we can't pay attention to these warnings if you even saw them in the first place. It's like the tiniest point of text is like 15 paragraphs down from the sign into link embedded. And that's what's needing to protect me to say, hey, make sure you don't click this link accidentally. So income pass keys. And so this is the five second demo video of me logging into now Google with a pass key. And that was the entire login experience. I clicked the button and I logged in. Let's see if I can replay that because it is very simple. And it's kind of hard to almost take in that this is the most secure possible login experience. I didn't have to type in a password. I didn't have to type in a two-factor code. I didn't have to do anything. All I needed to click a button was saying, hey, do you want to log in? Log in. So what are pass keys? Pass keys are another way to authenticate with a site that you want to connect with. You don't have to use passwords. You don't have to do two-factor authentication. It's really a one-click login. In this example, I'm clicking login and putting my face in my phone. It's authenticating with me, and I'm into my site. And it's phishing proof. That's phishing proof is the phrase that Apple used when they're discussing this, but it makes me a little more comfortable to say this is phishing proof. But it's actually phishing proof, and we'll kind of get into why in a second. So pass keys are you may have heard of this as a number name, which is called WebAuthn. So if you've heard of this developing over the past few years, it's been in progress for six years as part of FIDO, which is this standards organization that comes up with all these different ways that we can improve the web. And the important thing is that it's backed by Apple, Google, and Microsoft. This isn't just, hey, here's a little thing that is just from some little company over to the side that's saying, yay, hey, use us. This is something that has been backed by the major players. And at this point, it's now supported by all major browsers. If you're on the latest Mac OS, the latest Safari, the latest iOS, latest Windows, all that stuff, latest Android, you now have access to pass keys. And a big thing here is, uh, oh, yeah, those are just showing you the different pages. Um, so the big thing is how they work is using something called public key cri cryptography. Um, this is something that you don't really have to understand, and we're not going to get into, like, Here's the 10,000 pages on how public key cryptography works. But this is something that you're already using every day. It's in the technology for SSL, HTTPS, that kind of stuff, keeping your site safe if you're accepting online payments. Or really, if you just have a blog, you should be using HTTPS. It's for software updates. So anytime you download a new version of your operating system on your phone, your phone's checking to make sure that that is built by the people that the phone thinks it was built by. And it's keeping you safe. And so we don't really think about how those technologies work. And it's the same thing here for pass keys. All of this is happening in the background. You don't need to know what public key cryptography is. But we're going to dive a little bit more into it for a second. So this is kind of the flow for registering and creating a new pass key. And the way this works is I say to my site that I want to visit, hey, I want to create a new account. And the website replies back, send me a public key. So my phone for me, I don't need to do anything. I just say, okay, I want to log in, I want to create my account. Here it's going to create this pass key for me in the background. And it's going to send this public key up into the cloud, into the website that I'm connecting with. And in process, in practice, this is what that process looks like. So this is me creating a pass key for Google. So I've already logged into my account. I say, hey, I'm going to create a pass key. I create my pass key, and I'm done. That's it, that's my entire process. I now have a pass key that I've created. That means the next time that I want to log into Google, I can do it with one click. And so how does that login process work? So again, it's a kind of similar flow. I ask this website, hey, it's me, I want to sign in. But it needs a little bit more proof. So it asks me to sign this random bit of information with that key that we generated earlier. It says, okay, is the signature that you've signed, does it look good? If it does, they let you in. And what this means is that there's no private or sensitive information that is being passed along here. The only thing that is happening is happening on your device. It's completely private. And again, in process, this is what that looks like. I say, hey, I want to log in. I hit the login button, and I say I'm good. And I'm logging using a passkey. 
So to kind of summarize that process, your pass key, that, what that actually is, is a public-private key pair. And your device, your phone, your computer, your tablet, your watch, that's what keeps your private key safe. You don't need to memorize that, remember it like a password. There's nothing for you to do. Your device is taking care of everything for you. Your device oftentimes will guard that. So if you're using a kind of more modern device that has a touch ID or a face ID sensor, it uses those biometrics to sort of protect that private key. But those biometrics are never sent to that website. That's all just happening in your device to say, hey, we have this private key. I want to make sure as your iPhone or as your Mac or as your Google phone that, okay, that's really you. And so it checks your biometrics. So that's a kind of concern that people have is that, am I sending my face to Google when I log in like this? Absolutely not. The website then receives your public key. And whenever you need to log in, the site asks you to sign a challenge with your private key, the private key that is being kept safe by your phone. You don't have to do anything. It all happens in the background. So the big win here with pass key is that no personal information leaves your device. This means that account takeovers and phishing are way less possible. There's nothing for an attacker to steal. If we saw what we actually sent, if we look back a couple of slides, all we sent to the site we're trying to sign in with is our public key. There's no sense of information about us. There's nothing private. There's nothing that even if they stole those public keys, they could do anything with because they're public keys. So the fact that an attacker was able to steal that information doesn't even matter even if it were to hack you. And the big thing here is that you can't be tricked into giving up your password. So if you look at these screenshots here, if you are paying super close attention to some of those videos, you may have seen in the sign-on prompts that we have this like text here that says, hey, are you sure you want to sign in to security.test as an admin or into Google as team dx.tbjacobs.com with my email? And do you want to sign in? And if you look at that, you might say, oh, is this the only thing that's keeping me safe? Is the fact that I have to look at this text and make sure I'm not signing into somewhere malicious? The answer, though, is no. All of these different prompts, they say, hey, just so you're aware, this is where you are going to log into. But it's not possible for them to log you into an account that you don't know about. They can't say, hey, we're trying to be Gmail. And you just have to be super vigilant and say, oh, my God, am I sure I'm logging into Gmail? I think it's Gmail, but the domain name was like, a million characters long, I don't know. Your device won't let you give it up unless you're actually authenticating with a site that you authenticated with before. So there's no way for someone to send you a link that says, this is really me, gmail.com, and you get tripped and now your Gmail password's gone. Your device is doing all the hard work. And that's what it looks like with Microsoft. So there are two kinds of pass keys, and there's kind of like the geeky option and the option that everyone else is gonna use We've had this geeky option, which are roaming authenticators. These are separate hardware devices. They connect with Bluetooth or USB or NFCs, things like that. So those are these like uh, Yubi keys and Titan keys. You may have seen people use before that they carry them around with them and they plug them into the computer and they light up. And that's what kind of web authentication had been like for years and years and years. But the new advancement are these platform authenticators. And these are things that are built into your computer. They're built into your smartphone. They're often protected by biometrics, and they're just available for you that everyone can use, and they're available now. This is the browser support. Um, basically, if you're using a modern browser or a modern operating system, you have support for this. Uh, if you're a Linux user, you kind of got to go with a more PC route. Um, but for the platform authenticators, they're supported everywhere, basically. So you have this technology now. How passkeys work are kind of different in different environments. So I'm gonna take a kind of 10,000, excuse me, 10,000 foot overview at these different platforms. For Apple, passkeys are stored in your iCloud account. So this means they automatically get synced across all your devices. If you sign into an account and create an account on your iPhone, you'll be able to log in on your iPad, on your MacBook without doing any, any work whatsoever. They all just get synced into your iCloud account. In this experience, they work best with Safari right now. Um, Safari is kind of like, you know, the main browser that Apple's like, yeah, use this with. So it's where passkeys are best integrated for if you're in the Mac OS experience, but there are other options. You can also share passkeys with AirDrop. So if you're thinking, hey, sometimes I give someone else my password, probably shouldn't be doing that. But if you do have that scenario where you need to give someone else access to your account, uh, this is built in. You can just share your password with AirDrop, and they'll be able to log in that site, and they don't need to learn a password or anything. 
In Google, passkeys are stored in Google Password Manager, and they're synced across all your devices. So again, if you log in on your Android phone and then you want to use the desktop Google Chrome on your Mac or on your PC, you can do that without any trouble. This is kind of what that flow looks like. And again, for Google, the works best in Chrome is, you know, kind of two different ecosystems there, basically. In Windows, Windows, the story is a little bit different. Um, it's managed by Windows Hello. So Windows has kind of their own Windows Hello security system that's been built in for a long time. Your passkey right now in Windows is stored on your device itself. So if you create a passkey on your Windows tablet, you won't be able to necessarily, well, I was gonna say Windows Phone. Uh, if you still have a Windows Phone, congratulations. Um, but if you have a second or third Windows computer, you wouldn't be able to use that right now. Cross-device sync is something that Microsoft has said is gonna be coming soon to Windows natively. Uh, but for now, we're gonna say use Google Chrome for the best support, and you can sync it with Google Chrome's password manager, which you might already be using. So what about multi-platform families? So I'm all on board the Apple ecosystem, but some people have an Android phone and a Mac device, or an Apple phone and a Windows computer. How does that work? So browsers support using a passkey from a nearby device. So what this means is this is kind of the login flow where I'm logging into, let's say, my desktop computer, and I'm logging into Google Chrome, and then with my iPhone, I'm signing in. So what's happening here is I'm saying, okay, I want to log in. I don't have my pass key built into this computer. So instead, Google Chrome is going to say, okay, how do we know it's you? And what they're going to do is they're going to present this little pop-up that says, hey, scan this with your phone. My phone has the pass key. And so when I scan that QR code, my phone talks to the computer over Bluetooth, actually. And they say, okay, we agree that this is the right person. Send the information up into the server, and you get logged in. So this means that you can use whatever ecosystem you want to. The other thing though is that user accounts can have multiple pass keys. So if we saw back earlier, I had a iCloud pass key that was stored in my Google account, but you could also create a pass key for your Android phone, your Chrome device, you know, as many of them as you want. So if you're not in a scenario where, hey, my Apple pass keys sync perfectly with my Windows computer, you can create a pass key for both of them. And the first time you do that, you can kind of use this flow. So here's another, another example of what this looks like in the Microsoft Windows ecosystem. So this is a Windows computer. And I cut out the audio from this, but they're talking about how they're putting up a prompt to say, okay, I wanna make sure they wanna log in. You get a nice little QR code. And then with your phone, you can scan that QR code. Uh, and we're signed in at someone, and we can check the continue button. There we go. And we've now logged into that site. And so this experience uh, is implemented with all of the different uh, implementations, basically. So this is the same experience, but doing this with a Google phone and a Google Chrome device. They all have these options built in that say, hey, we know that you're not always going to have a pass key with you. Let's say you're traveling. You want to use a work computer um, or use a do you want to use the computer in the hotel room, things like that, is actually kind of has a better experience. Previously, if you were saying, okay, well, I've got a 24 character random password that I have in one password, maybe I'm gonna open it up in my phone and type out all 24 characters, and that's a pain. <laughs> the thing that I can do now is just point my phone at it with a pretty picture. So where can you use passkeys? This was the cool news that I woke up to a couple of days ago for World Password Day, is that Google has announced support for Google accounts themselves to actually support passkeys. So right now, if you use a Google account, you can go to your Google account center and say, hey, I want to set up a pass key. You can try it out today, right now. There are also a bunch of other services that are using it. Some popular ones are Microsoft, PayPal, and eBay also have support for it. And WordPress has support for it as well. Over on the bottom there, there's a link, and I'll post the slides for these online, called passkeys.directory. And this is basically a directory of all the sites that they know about. It's actually sponsored by 1Password that are keeping track of here are the places where you can use passkeys. So if you're like, okay, is my service up there? Are they supporting it yet? You can go on that site and check it out. So if you do want to use this in WordPress, you've got a couple of different options. Uh, I think Security Pro, which is the plugin that I work on, uh, we've supported passkeys now for, I think we were the first ones to do it. We launched support for it in September. Um, there's also a couple of other plugins. WP WebAuthn should let you do this, as well as Passwordless WP. 
So if you're thinking, why should I adopt this now? Can you please move back to that? Uh, yeah, we'll get back to it in a second. Okay. Um, so if you're thinking, why do I want to adopt passkeys now? They're way faster to use than passwords and two-factor. It will show you, you open up your phone, you click, okay, I want to sign in, and you're there. You don't need to type in your long password. You don't need to type in a separate two-factor codes. If you've got clients, you can help keep your clients secure. You know, as kind of more technical folks, oftentimes we're the ones with the best security on the WordPress site that we're logging into. But then maybe your clients, you're with meeting them one day, you see them type in their password and it's six characters, and you're like, oh my god, this is ridiculous. It's nice to get hacked. You can help keep your clients secure by teaching them how to adopt passkeys. And you can also be on the forefront of new technology. This is kind of new tech. And so if your clients are asking you, hey, they're coming to you, what's the best advice for attacking my WordPress site? I hear about all these WordPress sites getting hacked. You can tell them, hey, here's this new technology that I learned about that Google is adopting and everyone is adopting. And now's the time that you can try it out on your WordPress site too. So is the password dead? Well, not yet, but we're getting there. We're close. Until then, keep using strong passwords, set up two-factor whenever it's available. If you aren't already using a password manager, you might be without knowing it. They're built into all of our devices now. Google Chrome has them, Apple has them. But if you aren't using password and you're writing them down or kind of keep one in your head for every single site, start using a password manager. That's me. Uh, I'm Timothy Jacobs. I'm the lead developer at iTeam Security. Like I mentioned, I'm a WordPress core committer and co-organizer of the WordPress New York City Meetup group. You can find more about me at timothybjacobs.com or find out about iTeam Security over at iTeam.com security. Uh, so we'll open up any questions. Or you can also give me a pause. Yeah. <laughs> My head. Yeah, it's a lot. Do you, do you still have passwords for these, you know, the very complex ones, but now you don't have to punch them in? Exactly. So right now, that's kind of the, are we there yet? Not yet. So most of these accounts, Google, if you go there, they'll say, hey, you want to set up a passkey? And you can. But you still have a password for your account. Microsoft, they're actually the pioneers in this. You've been able to remove your password from your Microsoft account, I think, for like two years or so. So this is kind of the first step, which is let's get people using passkeys, but you still need to create a strong password for now. But in a couple of years, hopefully the idea is everyone uses passkeys, it's adopted everywhere, you don't have to use passwords anymore. And accounts can say, okay, you don't even need to set up a password if you don't want to. So that's kind of the long-term roadmap. And one other thing, so yeah. one thing we do often as people who take care of other people's sites is, can you create an account for me? Yeah. Uh, and how do you then get that information? Like, are you, you're still creating a user account for somebody in WordPress. Yeah. You still have a password, but then that person on their device, the user is going to actually set this up. Yeah, so this is kind of like the tricky flow. Um, and it's one of the things uh, that we do in the way we handle this with iTunes security is that we've had passwordless login support since before passkeys were thing. Passkeys were kind of the new feature that we added a couple of months ago. So the way that I see this kind of approaching is that the first time someone is setting up their account, they're going to get an email and say, okay, hey, we want to make sure that your email address is real, etc. And that gets them in the same way that they could receive, let's say, a password reset email. But once they log in for the first time, then we can prompt them to set up a passkey. So when you're setting up an account for someone, you're still going to need them to enter in an email address or something like that. But when they get a welcome email, it'll be, hey, welcome to my site.com. We see you've logged in. Let's set up a passkey so you can get it next time. So I think that's kind of how the flow is going to work, is that as we get into this, there's going to be kind of a partnership between passkeys and also email-based login. But the first time that happens, hopefully it's not, hey, I need to be waiting for this email all the time because I just tried to sign in and all that kind of stuff. So that's kind of how I see that flow happening. Yeah. What happens if you lose your device? Great question. So, what if I lose my device? Uh, so, platforms sync passkeys across all of your devices. So, the big thing is that if I lose my iPhone, my passkey is in my MacBook, in my iMac at home, it's in all those different places. But also, all of these different platforms, they have account recovery options. So, if I go to Apple and I say, hey, I lost my iPhone, and I lost my Mac, and I lost my watch, and everything is all gone. <laughs> what, what do I do? 
they usually have different account recovery options, and some of those are, hey, they tweak you a code that you should store with your birth certificate type of thing. So those are kind of your options there. Again, like I talked about, you can have multiple pass keys. So if you have different ecosystems, you can create multiple of them. If you are one of the people who's like really techie and wants to use it, you can use a YubiKey, for instance, and say, hey, I'm gonna put my pass key over there and save it. But basically, you shouldn't really need to, but the different services that you're already thinking, hey, if I lose access to everything, how do I get access to those other passwords? It's a similar kind of system. Use their account recovery procedures, stuff like that. But the big thing is that you wanna make sure that you're using a pass key ecosystem where it's not just on my phone, that it syncs to the web, it syncs across all my devices. So that's kind of like the big takeaway. Um, and until, until you get to the point where we're talking about Tim, of like, okay, everything's gone, you can still have a password. Um, so that's kind of your backup, 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 backup. Does that make sense? Yeah. Yeah, I, I have a couple of you know frequently asked questions. That I hear <laughs> Any others? Yes. Yeah. So just I'm trying to understand the linking between the identity and yeah. then the, the password login. So obviously, so when you set up with either Google or Apple, for mm -hmm. example, does that get when you go then log in? One of those is always going to send, for example, Google the the Google for the username part. Is yeah. It's going to send the email address of that, or like in the WordPress case, is it once you get through that provisioning flow? Has the WordPress thing sort of set up its, its own version with whatever username you use in WordPress? I guess, to, you know, could you use a different, can you use the Google passkey and then have a different email login for? It's a great question. So the biggest analog we have currently, I think, is like social login, right? Where like, hey, I have a Gmail account, so any single time I want to sign in somewhere, I'm going to look for the sign in with Google account. Passkeys are completely different. So the ecosystem that you live in doesn't really matter from the service perspective. When I create a new passkey, this is like, it's a simplified version, but it's literally the sets. So the only thing that I'm sending to WordPress, let's say, is this public key that my device generated. They don't know that I'm a Google user or an Apple user, that I have a Gmail account or any of that. You don't have to say, hey, I need to make sure that I'm doing this with my work Gmail or my personal Gmail or anything like that. You type in the email address that you'd want to type in with and say, hey, I want to register as this user. And then you say, okay, I'm gonna use my device to create a passkey. The actual ecosystem that you're a part of doesn't matter. And it's kind of what's the cool thing from, from a privacy perspective. If you were using like signing with Google, Google knows all the sites that you're signing in with, but now really they don't know anything. Does that make sense? Yeah, yeah, so, so when you go to WordPress, there'd still be the prompt to type in your username, mm -hmm. but just no password box. Exactly, you don't have a password box. So you're Even, still saying, this is who I am. Exactly. But then, and then all the other stuff can happen in the background. So there's also an even cooler option that you don't even need to type in your username. Um, you just say, hey, I want to tie into my, I want to use a passkey. Mm -hmm. And your device knows, okay, these are all the passkeys that we have for this site. And it'll actually prompt you if you have, let's say, for my testing account, I have like 15 different WordPress users that I've created passkeys for. And I'll say, hey, which of these 15 users do you want to site, sign into this WordPress site with? And I get to pick one. If you only have one, it'll just do it for you. So you don't even need to enter a username. And in the future, you could not have, you could have a completely usernameless option. So. If you don't want to collect someone's email address, you wouldn't have to. So that's, 